We've been in a series that's called Life, and uh, we've, gone, uh, we've had two mini-series so far in this bigger series, and we're going to start the third today. Uh, well, where we've been, well, we started with life, the source. The source of life is Christ himself, and the first three messages kind of surrounded these things. The first was the claim, the claim of Christ, and here's what he claimed. He claimed that he had come to have, that he might give them, which is his followers, life. Not to, and he didn't just stop there. Life to the full. And so basically this entire series is, we want to look into this. What does that look like? What kind of life is Jesus talking about here? Have it to the full? Really? That sounds pretty awesome. And so the whole series is actually exploring this statement from Jesus. And then we started with the way. Pastor Bob talked about the way of Jesus, uh, the way that he's laid out for us to follow. We went to abide, uh, the, the words from Jesus, to abide in me or remain in me as I remain in you. And apart from me, you can do nothing. There's this idea that we're connected to the vine as branches. Um, cool imagery, if you're, especially if you're a farmer or like to grow grapes. That's awesome. And then we uh, transitioned into life together, and Pastor Bob did all these three, and we talked about uh, the images that are given to us in the New Testament, uh, the body, the bride, and the family. And today, we're starting a new series, or a mini-series, called Life Surrendered. <clears throat> so, that's a few questions come to mind right away. The surrendered life. What does that look like? What does a surrendered life look look like. And this week, I did a lot of reading. I went back and I'm reading through all of these old saints and their lives, and so many of them had a lot to say about surrender. The second question that came to my mind is, does it really lead to life to the full? Because isn't the push from our, kind of the air we breathe here in Canada, the opposite? That there's you know, surrender, submit, you know, these words, obedience, like sometimes uh, something happens to us because, you know, the air we breathe is what we've grown up in in this individualistic culture. Those things are like, ooh, careful. And so there's something in us that goes, that really? Life to the full? Submission? Surrender? Sounds like you're giving up. <laughs> How can that be life to the full? So we're going to explore that question. Really, the whole message is exploring that question. And then finally, what's holding us back? We're going to end today's message by answering this question. So as I was reading and thinking, going like, what is the surrendered life? And praying, going like, Lord, what is it? What is it today? What does it look like today? This is, this is what I came up with, this something. Something deep within us yearns greatly for this full life. And people throughout history have spent their lives, like literally spent their lives, trying to find it. But it runs counter to what we think and feel. And so remains out of reach for so many. And I know lots of us feel like this. And we've been talking about this now for, I don't know, how many weeks? Six weeks? And for some of us, that's still kind of, we still haven't grasped it. Still have that feeling of emptiness. Like, we're still, yeah, I don't know. Is the way of Jesus really the full life? So here's, um, just to kind of transition us into our text for today, a couple of quotes from A.W. Tozer. He was an Alliance pastor who lived in the uh, mid-1900s. I think he passed away in 1963, and oh yeah, we're, <laughs> it was in the Sunday morning, so as a pastor, the first thing I thought of was like, oh, who preached that week? Like, isn't that terrible? Like, shouldn't be like, oh no, <laughs> he passed away. <laughs> Sorry. That's the way my brain thinks, because Sunday morning, we're getting ready for stuff, right? So this is what uh, A-Dub says, the yearning to know what cannot be known, to comprehend the incomprehensible, to touch and taste the unapproachable arises from the image of God in the nature of man. Deep calleth unto deep, 
and though polluted and landlocked by the mighty disaster theologians call the fall, the soul senses its origin and longs to return to its source. And he puts it another way in The Pursuit of God, his book. So the life of man upon the earth is a life away from the presence, wrenched loose from that blissful center, which is our right and proper dwelling place, our first estate, which we kept not, the loss of which is the cause of our unceasing restlessness. We've lost that spot. And so that's when I'm talking about this yearning. There's something in us, this restless, that just desires to fill your life. And I want it. I want a full life. And I think we're all there. None of us, because the opposite of a full life is an empty life. And I think we're like, nah, <laughs> that's not that appealing. All right, so let's get to it. What's the surrendered life? Oh, by the way, our, uh, our title is A Kingdom Without a King. But we'll get to that in a little while. If you're going like, how does this fit? (laughs) You'll see. So our text is going to be Matthew 16. And uh, in Matthew 16, just uh, to kind of catch you up to speed, Jesus answers the question of what a surrendered life looks like and how to do it. Now, it's an interesting text. It's powerful. It's actually in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, it's a very significant moment for Jesus and his disciples. But we need to get a little background to this text itself. So Jesus is teaching, and he's talking with his 12 disciples and has a couple significant moments with them in quick succession. The first is he asks the question, who do you say that I am? And so that, you know, the disciples toss, you know, some people say you're a prophet, some people say you're the prophet Elijah, some people say, and he goes, like, well, but who do you say, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus, at that moment, says, blessed are you, Simon. <laughs> that, that, wasn't given to you, that was given to you by the Spirit. I was like, oh, isn't that cool? Okay, second moment happens immediately after. So Jesus takes that, you know, after he talks about this, he takes some time and he's just kind of like, I'm sure he's talking to his disciples and And uh, they get around to Jesus kind of going like, hey, um, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm going to be, I'm going to be led away. I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed. (laughs) And so, you know, Peter, who had just received this um, commendation from Jesus, uh, receives, receives this, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) And this is like, in the text, it seems like it happens within minutes, right? And so you have this, this idea that, you know, Peter's all in. And then a moment later, <laughs> Jesus is calling him Satan. Uh, but it is interesting. You do need to look. He didn't look at Peter. It says he looked at his disciples when he said this. And so what's going on here? Why, would, why is Jesus saying this? Well, this goes back to the temptation that Jesus faced in, in his four, after his 40-day 40, uh, 40 fast. Satan wanted, came in and tempted him, baited him, trying to um, make Jesus or take, get Jesus to take a shortcut. You know, God, you're going to rule all over this anyway. Why go through the suffering? Here, I'll just give it to you if you worship me. That's what Satan said. And Jesus, of course, responds with the word and says, No. <laughs> And so this is what is in mind. This is, this is where, where we got to go. This is why Jesus is saying, get me behind me. Get behind me, Satan. This is the same temptation he faced in his 40-day fast, after his 40-day fast. And here's the key statement that we need to take into our next text. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, after Jesus says this, Gives us a picture. He's just with the 12. After he says this, he's like, ah, this has got to go bigger than this. And so he calls the crowds and continues the teaching, explaining. And it's all about this statement and what has just happened. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So we get into, uh, let's get into our chapter. It's Matthew chapter 16. 
And we're going to read, uh, starting in verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet, you, yet, yet loses his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. A couple of notes before we continue. This is the first time Jesus uses the term for himself, Son of Man, in front of the crowds. Now, he's used it in front of his disciples, but it's all been hush-hush. This is the first time he's done this. Something significant is going on here. Secondly, this whole idea of some of you will not taste death, the very next thing that happens in chapter 17, I think, I think Jesus is actually speaking to the three that went up to the mountain with him for the transfiguration, that they saw something incredible. In fact, Peter writes about it in his, in, in his letters. The, the third thing I want us to see, as it will color the way we go into this text, is Jesus talking about judgment and the glory of his Father. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay or judge each person according to what he has done. So the weight of this text is very weighty. Those last statements are put in there very specifically by Jesus to announce something. This is very important. We're talking about kings and kingdoms here. That Jesus is going to come back with his angels, that he's going to come back as the king. Now, of course, they don't know that yet because he hasn't first died as the king, but he's coming. And so that's going to color the way we look at this text. So the surrendered life. Three things that Jesus says in this text about the surrendered life and then an appeal to a fin financial uh, appeal. What does it profit, right? First of all, deny yourself. <laughs> so if you're coming this morning going like, I need a, I need a good feel-good message today. I hope this is feel-good for you. But uh, it seems negative, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna delve into this because I seriously believe with all my heart what Jesus is talking about is life and life to the, live to the full, and this is where it begins. Not self-denial, it's deny yourself, something greater than just uh, denying a few things in your life. It's bigger than that. It doesn't sound very nice, and it isn't the full life, or isn't the full life, according to our culture at least, one of indulgence. And not just the culture out there. We live in this culture. Isn't that the push? Again, it's that, that's kind of like the, the air we breathe around here. Like if you have an appetite, you should fill it. I mean, isn't that what advertising is all about? You have this appetite. Oh, you should fill it. You deserve it. Look how hard you work. Look how good of a person you are. Look how much better this could make you. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that what advertising is about? You need to have this. So you can satisfy those appetites that you have, and then that's the way to true life. That's, that's successful advertising right there. So it's getting ahead. Financial security, right? Who, who hasn't dreamed about financial security? Let's, let's move, forget about moving to an island. Let's buy an island <laughs> and then move there. Fulfilling all of our desires a perfect family, amazing spouse, great sex, well-mannered children, meeting retirement goals, maybe even early, freedom to do what we want in our future. Aren't all these things wrapped up to the things that we think about, to things that we desire and that we want? That's why we're so susceptible to advertising. Because advertising gets those themes and they deliver them to us. But deny yourself is something different. It is the laying down 
of the self. The surrender of our will to his will. It's a wholehearted embrace of obedience and living for his glory, for the glory of God. That's what this idea of denying yourself is. It's not trusting your will over his or your ideas over his. It's his ideas, his will. This is what C.S. Lewis says. The terrible thing, the almost impossible thing is to hand over your whole self, right? Because Jesus isn't talking about, give me a smidgen of yourself. This is a whole thing. All your wishes and precautions to Christ. But it is far easier than what we're all trying to do instead. For what we are trying to do is remain what we call ourselves to keep personal happiness as our great aim in life. And yet, at the same time, be good. Because isn't one of the deepest desires that we have in us is to be good? To be a, a good spouse? To be a good parent? To be a good friend? To be a good student? To be a good athlete? To be a good... You fill it in. You fill in the blank. There's something in us where we just desperately want to be good. And I think that goes back to what A.W. Tozer was enlightening us at the start of the sermon that there's something deep that calls out from us. I think it's this image that God has created in us where there's this desire we want to be good. We just struggle to make it happen. Or we don't even know we're struggling. We've just got our own idea of what it needs to be good, and away we go. Second part of the surrendered life Jesus talks about is pick up your cross. That sounds a little morbid, (laughs) but not nearly as morbid as it would have to a first century Jew. These people had seen the death march, dead men walking with beams on their backs, already dead but still moving. They knew the Romans. The Romans, they were very effective at torture and killing. They had seen this. And so this would have been horribly shocking. It's like, what? Pick up your cross. What are you, crazy? Remember, Jesus had not picked up his literal cross yet. But what he is talking, this is the type of life that he is living. He picked up the cross at the beginning. This is his whole life. It's a life of surrender. It's a life of dying to self. It's a life like Jesus. See, picking up the cross is both a one-time event and a daily decision. So in the other uh, versions of this, it says pick up your cross daily. Or or the other Gospels. So this idea that there is this one-time deal where you surrender your life, but then it's like, oh, every every morning, i got to do this again. I've got to walk with Jesus. I've got to pick up my cross. See, I think this is what uh, ties back to what was happening with Jesus and the disciples. The road's going to be difficult because suffering precedes glory. Suffering precedes glory. The road was not easy. It's a, it's, a dif- it's a difficult thing. I mean, Jesus talks a lot about persecution, talks a lot about people hating you because you love him. The road's going to be hard. This is how Paul says it in Romans. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Awesome. And if children, then heirs. Whoa, heirs. Even better. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Wow. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified. With him. Well, that doesn't sound as good. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this is this is the so Paul is explaining, this is the perspective we need to have. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Even creation is waiting for this moment. Again, this, this shortcut is like, you don't need to suffer. You don't have to go through hard times. You don't have to, you don't have to live your life fully for Jesus. I mean, those are the lies. And finally, follow me. Jesus calls his disciples to follow the way of Christ. He lived it out. This is how we live. And how do we know we're following him? Is well, we, be, we start becoming like him, right? First John says we, we walk as Jesus walked. In fact, if you, he says if you are in Christ, you will walk as Jesus walked. That's a huge statement. He's not just talking about Jesus' saunter or whatever, <laughs> right? He's talking about his life. That your life, as you follow Jesus, will begin to look more and more like his. We call that sanctification. That's the road you're traveling. And as you draw near to God, as you follow Jesus, you get to become like Jesus. And God's on that. He's on, that's his job. That's what he's doing, his work in you as a believer. He's conforming you into the image of Christ as you walk like Jesus walked. Now I have to pause for a moment because have you ever asked yourself this question? Did Jesus live the full life? Now every one of us here will be like, well, of course. Well, maybe not. I shouldn't speak for everybody. But for most of us, I think it would be, well, of course he did. Did he? Is that the life that you want? To be spit on and reviled, hated, persecuted, rejected by your own, your closest people betray and reject you, deny that you even, I don't know that guy. Now, there's also some other moments, right? Let's not just pick on the tough ones. Jesus had some great moments. But can we, is that, when we think of the full life, do we think of Jesus and his life and what he lived? I'll confess to you, that's, that's, I, that's not the first thing that comes to mind. I'm thinking probably of other things. I'm thinking, well, actually, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I have a spot for that. <laughs> but ask yourself, when I'm dreaming of a full life, does it look like the life that Jesus lived? Single, did a lot of walking, didn't have a home, homeless. But here's, here's the picture I had as I was thinking about this. Jesus is calling in these people, and he's sitting them down. Remember, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together all the time. Jesus is part of, the, of creating these people. He's God. So just dream with me for a moment. As Jesus calls these children in, and they come and they sit at his feet, how much joy does that bring God? Remember, Jesus is God. How much joy was flowing through Jesus as he saw these people that he had created there? Wasn't his heart be soaring as, as in the person he gets to talk about what it means to follow him, what it looks like to surrender your life to him? It was a picture. I, it was powerful for me this week. I was like, wow. How much joy is he filled with because his people that he loves so much, are, he's surrounded by them. And now he gets to tell them, this is the way, you guys. This is the way to life. I think it was epic. <laughs> so we, get, we come to, um, so those are the three things. We come to our um, middle section here where Jesus is, is appealing just to reason right he's like what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet he loses his soul so basically what he's talking about here is if you're going to pursue your own stuff like you could do that your whole life gain in the entire world if that were possible and yet 
that would be too co- that would be too costly. Your soul is much more, worth much more than that. A soul is worth so much. In fact, it's worth so much that Jesus decided to die for you. To take care of your sin and God's wrath poured out on sin. He did that. And I'm sure Jesus, this is in the back of mind. He knows where he's going. He just told his disciples what was going to happen. He was going to go and, and, and be killed and suffer and die. So here's the great barrier to the surrendered life. Here is the problem. I mean, you could say there's lots of problems, but I think this is where it all comes from. We want to be king. This is the great problem. We want to be king. Started in the garden and has continued ever since. We want to call the shots. We want to live the life that we want to live. And we don't want anyone else, including Jesus, telling us how to do it. See, we all want the benefits of the kingdom. But we don't want Jesus to tell us what to do or how we should live. Two things. First of all, isn't this the drumbeat of our culture? I mean, where do you think the concept of human rights came from? It's in no other religion. None. It came from Christianity. It came from Jesus himself. Judaism would be the other one, sorry. But we're, we came from them. <laughs> right? There's, human rights aren't anything to anyone except for Jesus. Where, do, where, where have all of these organizations come from that feed the poor? Like hands at work that Grace is talking about. How do those things start? It's from people who follow Jesus. Where does the soup kitchen start? Where do, the, where do all of these things that take care of the poor and the needy, where do they come from? Where did hospitals come from? <laughs> from Christianity, from Christians, because we care. We think every life is valuable, whether it's unborn or 98. Or, and if you're above 98, that, sorry. <laughs> it's valuable too. All life is valuable. All of it. That's from Jesus. That's from the Bible. That's what the Bible teaches us. Every single human is made in the image of God. And so we have a culture that, well, not just a culture, we have a world that wants all of these kingdom benefits. They don't want the king. Don't tell us how to live our lives. Don't tell us about sexuality. Don't tell us about what we need to do and don't do. Don't. No, 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 no. But they sure want the benefits. And that doesn't just go outside the church walls, by the way. I guess the church doesn't have walls. But <laughs> Sorry. I thought of something someone had written. It's in the church as well. Because this is the ever-present struggle. We want to be king. And in order to be king, we need to be able to do what we want. So Oswald Chamber uh, puts it, and how to become one with Jesus. To become one with Jesus Christ, a person must be willing not only to give up sin, but also to to surrender his whole way of looking at things. So this is a radical change. It's not just about your behavior. It's everything. It's how you think. It's how you live. Your behaviors are symptoms of what's going on inside. And this is his kind of caveat. Encouragement as well. We will suffer a sharp, painful disillusionment before we fully surrender. When people really see themselves as the Lord sees them, it's not the terribly offensive sins of the flesh that shock them, 
but the awful nature of the pride of their own hearts opposing Jesus Christ, or Christ means the king. That's what's in us. Desire to be king. It's that pride that dwells there, that's constantly pushing, 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 pushing. I want my will to be done. I want my desires filled. I want my way to happen. Of course, we have to, we have to ask this question. This is the question. What will it profit you if you get your way in every possible form? What will it profit you? Do you gain it all, all of your dreams and hopes, but lose your soul? What will it profit you? Back to Adub. Kind of gets us, uh, gives us some reason here. The reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little progress is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves. We're still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work within us. Perfect picture of what we're struggling through. Because the king gives orders. The subjects listen. So I had to, I had to pass this off to Bob uh, this week because I was like, Bob, does this make sense? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Tell me if I'm off. He's like, yeah, I haven't heard it before, but go with it. I, I think it's a good, a good thought. So here we go. Daydreams. What do you dream about? Have you ever wondered what's deep inside you? What it is you're really yearning for when it comes to this idea of living life to the full? Now, it may not be fair if you're like, Daydreaming, what's that? <laughs> I'm a dreamer, and so I'm thinking, oh, wow. <laughs> right? A, a bit of a con- complen- contemplative, I, I like to think, I like to dream, I like to... What are your dreams about? What are the things you find yourself thinking about that, you're, oh, you kind of go, oh, I'm daydreaming. Could those be an indicator of what's deeper inside? The life that you're actually running after? I'm not saying this to guilt us. Daydreaming is fine. It better be because otherwise I'm in trouble. It's okay to dream about that next vacation or whatever. But it's the, the accumulation of your dreams. If you think overarching, what do I dream about? Where does my mind go when it's, when I have time? My bet is it goes to where you think life is found. That's why there's, I think there's uh, passages like Psalm 1. It talks about meditating on the word of God day and night. This is interesting. You might go like, oh, that's weird. But yeah, dreaming about God's word, dreaming about God and who he is because God's word, you know, it, it points us to him. It's not an end unto itself. It points us to God. It's his revelation of himself. How about the next step of this? If you're a parent, what do you dream for your kids? I think that might even be more clear. What do you dream for your children? Because that is also an indicator, I would say, of where you think life lies. Because it's the life you want for these children that you have. Is it a life of suffering for Jesus? Don't say that. Is it? That they would hold true to the faith no matter what? Now, it's not that we hope that that happens. But I think we need to check our dreams. Because the the dreams that you have in your mind and then the words that you're telling your kids, at some point, you've got to realize that what you're living out is this is what you want for them, not necessarily what you're telling them. And so, what's holding you back? from experiencing this full life, what's holding you back from surrendering fully to Jesus? It's a question for you to ask yourself. And it's a really easy so what to this message. 
one question. What haven't you surrendered? What are you holding on to? That Jesus is going, just let go of it. I want to finish by uh, reading a hymn that you probably know. It's called Take My Life. It's from Frances Havergal. She was, uh, I can't even say the, the Worcestershire. <laughs> See, that's where she's from, somewhere in the UK. <laughs> it's so hard to say. They should just say dub sauce or something, <laughs> if you know what that sauce is. Anyway, if you don't, then you're like, what? So a kingdom without a king, I don't want it. And I especially don't want to try to be the king even though I know what's in my heart and I have to push myself off the throne <laughs> every single morning. That's what it means to pick up the cross. You've got to get up off the throne. So this is uh, Francis' uh, one of the hymns that she wrote. She was a poet and hymn writer. And it's very, you'll, you'll probably, I'm not going to sing it for you, although I, I do feel, I almost want to. <laughs> Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall no longer be mine. Sorry, it shall be. She's a way better poet than me. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine to own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour, all, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. This is my prayer for us, it's my prayer for myself. Take my life, O Lord. I don't want to try to save it and then lose it. I want to lose it for Christ and for the gospel. And I hope you do too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for, thank you for these words that you have uh, written or given to us in Scripture. Thank you for the example of Christ that he's not just talking about this stuff. He lived it out. Lord, the call is, is hard. It's difficult to give over our lives. It seems like we're holding on to so much, and yet the illusion, that's just an illusion. We aren't holding on to a lot. And what you have to give us far surpasses anything that we could even imagine on this earth. And Lord, as you... Uh, you gave us those words right at the start of this passage that our mind needs to be on the things of God, not the things of men, not the temporary stuff. Lord, I pray that you would renew our minds. You would help us to be thinking about you and who you are. That you would, you would give us this new vision of life to the full and get rid of the old vision that we've been living in. Lord, we just ask that you would do this for each and every one of us. Give us what we need to lay ourselves down. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.